For over 10 years, we at Climate One have been engaging policymakers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. Thanks for joining us for this live stream discussion of climate ambition as the election gets underway and our nation- You're taking the dog, right, Ken? <laughs> the, uh, so. the loss of the iconic Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> um, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. I would like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Miwok people who inhabited these lands for 10,000 <laughs> years. We'd love to hear from you today. So please share your questions in the comments section of the live stream, or you can tweet them at us using our handle at Climate One. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast that drops every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your pods. I'm delighted to welcome three moms and amazing guardians of our mother earth. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge my own mom. Today's her birthday and she died a couple of months ago after a long battle with dementia. I was at her side holding her hand, which is a blessing during these times of COVID when so many Americans are dying alone. One day when I was a child, she said, come on, let's go to the beach. I eagerly California, where I grew up. When we arrived, it was not the fun I was expecting. About 20 adults were standing around holding signs saying, protect our coast, yes on 20. It was a rally for a statewide ballot initiative that led to the creation of the California Coastal Commission. As I played in the sand, an elderly man was talking. He was of no interest to me, though I later learned that his name was Ansel Adams. It was 1972, and the state had plans for four nuclear power plants on the coast, including one at Moss Landing, 15 minutes upwind from my home. We drove home that day in our huge Lincoln station wagon, no seat belts, with fake wood paneling and a Yes on 20 bumper sticker. Proposition 20 passed and the planned nuclear plants were never built. That's my earliest memory as a young environmentalist, and I just want to share that thanks and thanks to my mom. She taught kindergarten at the Fort Ord Army Base for many years and taught me how to love people and nature. And now I'm delighted to welcome three badass women. Annie Leonard is executive director of Greenpeace. She became an internet sensation for her Story of Stuff series. Gina McCarthy is president and CEO of the NRDC Action Fund and former chief of the US EPA under President Obama was under her leadership that the U.S. passed the Clean Power Plan and advanced the CAFE standards that are two pillars of the Paris Climate Agreement. And tomorrow, Tolls O'Loughlin is North America Director of 350.org. She's co-chair of Green Leadership Trust, a network of indigenous and people of color who serve on the boards of national environmental organizations. It's an honor to be with you three. Thank you for coming on Climate One. Gina McCarthy, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, when Joe Biden was running for vice president, there were high hopes for national climate policy. Barack Obama and John McCain both supported economy-wide legislation, but that didn't materialize after the election. As we look forward to a Biden presidency, what lessons can be drawn from the failure 12 years ago to get a national plan in place? Well, I think... I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned. First is how do you use your mute button when you're trying to take care of a puppy? That's my first lesson. Uh, and, and, but, but the second is, you know, one of the things that, that thankfully I think Joe Biden did uh, when he really was getting the nod for his nomination and before that happened is he spent a lot of time with environmental justice advocates. You know, he, he really is a, a person who was uh, 
uh, engaged somewhat in climate, but but it I don't think it was as yet sort of ingrained into him. Well, it is now, <laughs> you know, because they personalize this for him. And he's a very personally wonderful human being uh, just from knowing him. And and he so it, the lesson is is that for me has always been don't talk about climate as a planetary problem. Don't don't actually dissect it from all the other systemic challenges we have with conventional pollution and with systemic racism that has led to so many communities having disproportionate impact. And, 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 th and then make sure you talk about it in relevant terms. You know, I think way too much us green groups um, really just talk about we, the only thing we care about is birds and bunnies who are lovely, but, but really we're all talking about human beings and our human lives and, and it needs to be related to families. It needs to be related to on the ground improvements. So my hope is that instead of running to now big, big solutions that don't dedicate real benefits to, to black and brown, Hispanic, indigenous communities first and foremost, that those no longer are the thing to shoot for. We need two first. <laughs> I don't just want greenhouse gases. I want fossil fuels gone. I want fossil fuels out of products. I don't want to help fossil fuel industry to, to extend their life. I want them to recognize that this is bringing down communities, most importantly, environmental justice communities. And the best thing about Biden's plan is he centers justice and equity, and he, and he indicates and commits to 40% of the investments that we need to make to boost us out of our economic doldrums are actually going to be invested in environmental justice communities. So, so between the time he started campaigning for this presidency and, and the time he was nominated, we now have a president that I believe is, has full-throated the, the effort of addressing climate and his engagement in it. And I'm really excited about it. It is by far and away the most aggressive climate plan of any presidency. Can it get better? Sure. You're sitting with three women advocates who are gonna demand better, but we'll always do that because it's never gonna be enough because we got to act and do it all now. Tomorrow. Tolls O'Loughlin, you say that when Joe Biden is fighting for real people, he's gutsy. How do you rate the Biden-Harris mm -hmm. plan uh, for, for climate action? Uh, I'd say it is the most ambitious plan to date. That actually says much more about the canon of presidents than it does about this particular moment that we're in, to be fair. But I do think there has been a real um, responsiveness to what our demands are. I'm here on behalf of young people, on behalf of people who are no, who wouldn't consider themselves young in any space, on behalf of that multiracial, multi-generational organizing that really pushed us to this moment, recognizing that the establishment is not going to get where it's going if business as usual is what's on the menu. So it really does does feel like we're in a conversation about climate ambition because it was job one for all of us who care about this work to make sure that it was as important as any other issue and really the umbrella that it is because you can't talk about education or voting rights or any of the other things on a planet that does not exist. And as I have said it before and I will say it again, until I see a room full of bears sitting around trying to talk about how to save us from climate change, people and planet is where the work is happening. Any Leonard, presidents typically have priorities and lots of people pulling on them. How will climate rank in the context of a global pandemic, record unemployment? It's one thing to have a plan. It's another thing to get it through Congress once in power. And we saw last time that, you know, healthcare went before climate. Will that happen again? Absolutely not. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is we are not going to let them. The movement is so strong, so united. The context is different than the last time Joe Biden was anywhere near the White House, is that the science has changed, climate crisis is here and now. I mean, it is so clear that it cannot be postponed. At this point, with the time frame we're operating in, there's no material difference between a climate denier and a climate delayer. They have to hit the ground running on day one. But the great thing is that we don't, we don't have the luxury to solve one problem at a time, but we don't need to, because the great thing is how much the solutions are interconnected. We can do things like massive investment in clean energy infrastructure that addresses environmental justice, disproportionate harm. It addresses the economic doldrums Gina referred to. 
Like the same things can solve all of these problems at once if we have a comprehensive approach, if we stay um, united, which I have total confidence we're going to do. Hey, I just want to take one technical pause here. Arnav, I want to make sure that Annie's going to sound clean on, on the Zencaster more so than what we're hearing her now. You tell us. Um, um, Tamara, climate used to be about future generations. In recent weeks, we've seen climate crises on both coasts, wildfires of biblical proportions, and five hurricanes spinning at the same time at the, in the Atlantic. How is the political calculus changing, especially for young Americans? Mm, I would say that the, we're in the middle of a four generation time period. There are four generations of people in the workplace. There are four generations of advocates, folks who started out at Woodstock with half an idea, ended up with a job. And, 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 and I speak on behalf of 350 and just say that, you know, we're middle aged at 10 years old because some groups started exactly two minutes ago and others have been around for over a hundred years. And we're in a moment where we're all pushing for the same thing at once. Energy needs wisdom and vice versa. And so we are in a time when the youth agenda is no different than the black agenda, than the indigenous agenda, because at the end of the day, we need to be in a space where we can move the needle for change because there is no separation of, um, of uh, success here. We're, we're in a time test as Bill McKibben likes to call it. And I assure you that at the end, when the buzzer is up, we'll all be in the same boat. So we might as well be running in the same direction. So for youth who are raising it, they are supported by middle-aged people who've been asking for it. And by the elderly who are, in my opinion, are frankly willing to sacrifice everything. I've seen more seasoned people running out in the street to get arrested and putting their bodies on the line than I have in the last 15 years. If you find me a room full of seniors, I probably got the most reckless bunch you've ever seen. So just wanna flag that it, this is a multi multi-age effort that really does take up the leadership of youth and follow where they are pushing. They want a planet that they can live on. They're very clear on what that looks like. They are not settling for the decisions that have been made for them about agreements they did not sign up for and debt they don't want to take up. And I think about Jamal Bowman. He's a, you know, he won a primary, toppled a 30-year veteran of the uh, Democratic establishment in New York. Tomorrow, what does that say to you about sort of the, the Democratic establishment, how they've done on this problem? And people are saying that you're not moving fast enough. It says that nobody's safe. The political calculus has changed because <laughs> everything is on the table. This isn't a question of whether or not we pose the right thing that Congress will like accept because people are willing to remove the folks who sit in those seats if they're not making the right decisions. We're not calling for a referendum on business as usual. We're calling for the end of business as usual. We're not calling for a wraparound plan where we figure out how to do a little bit of bad stuff. We're calling for the end of sacrifice zones. And that is about making sure nobody feels safe continuing to feed us a line instead of doing the work. So the organizing that you see in the streets has very quickly moved into organizing around political candidates who can speak that language. If they're not pushing for a Green New Deal and figuring out what jobs, infrastructure, and human health costs will, will have to take up, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about the Green New Deal, whether we call it that or not, we're going to pay for jobs, infrastructure, and human health. So there isn't a single person in any committee who can hide out in their office and not respond to that. Gina McCarthy, speaking of no one is safe, everything's on the table. There's a class of people in America who live on the coast, who maybe they're environmentally oriented. They might write checks to NRDC or the Commonwealth Club or Climate One. And a lot of them want to keep mainly market structures in place and take out brown energy and put in green energy and keep everything else in place and keep their comfortable lifestyles in place. Is that realistic? No. No, I think life, I think life is changing. And, you know, <clears throat> the, the reason why we're seeing people my age on the streets is probably because we were given the gift of having grandchildren. <laughs> and so I'm not now worried about my sacrifice. I am worried about handing to them a future that I'm going to be proud of. And I've worked my entire life for this. And if you think I wouldn't really talk turkey with some of these older people who think you can still remain comfortable and that you can sort of position yourself to get a little done, but don't we really have much meaning in my life? It's just not right. You know, I want it to have meaning in my life. I am sick and tired of the embarrassment of systemic racism. And, and yes, I'm uncomfortable about all the change I need to do as quickly as people are demanding at NRDC and other places. Of course, it's uncomfortable. 
but we got to embrace it, right? This is a time for change. And the most, it, the only thing that I can, that gets me up in the morning is to know that we are so bad off that change is essential. And that like I'm with Annie and, and, and Tamara and everybody to say that we can fix this if everybody's voice is heard. And that if nobody speaks for somebody else, but we speak in unity together. And if we can get that done, you know, I love the idea that, that people who have been comfortable sitting in Congress for 40 years getting used to this little march of, of really pokey people, right? If they, if they just get a, you know, a sense that they can't be comfortable anymore, that, that having this 40 years doesn't give them any benefit. And in fact, if they haven't figured it out by now, they're not going to hang around. I really think that's great. You know what I call that, Greg? And you'll figure this out. It's called democracy. <laughs> so if you don't do the will of the people and instead you want to maintain things as they are because it benefits you or because you don't think you contributed to the problem, then I'm sorry. It's just not working anymore. So we got to get comfortable being uncomfortable and we got to stop trying to make it go away in a flash and really make people go away in a flash out of government who haven't figured out that we don't need little steady progress, but we need big leaps. We need those to be doable. We need them to bring people behind. We need them to shift jobs, not leave workers behind. We need labor engaged. We just have to be smart enough to recognize that this is a social system where you, you fix the system, not a single thing in it. You fix it all at once. And, and we can figure that out. This is not rocket science. And anyway. say, if we don't fix it, we start again. Just want to flag that there's another option on the yeah. table here. And it's one that's a lot messier than getting this thing together. Right. If, and that's where I say to those elites who think that they want change to happen on their terms and their pace, uh, if it doesn't happen fast enough, um, there's people who have a lot less to lose. There's nothing worse than young people with no hope, no job in terms of, you know, bringing, bringing change faster than the establishment wants. Uh, any lettered, much of the climate conversation rests on the responsibility of individuals and corporations. You say the way we talk about that is shaped by the famous crying Indian TV ad launched on Earth Day in 1971. Let's listen. Some people have a deep abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. from 1971. Annie Leonard, what's the significance of that ad and how is it relevant to the climate conversation we are having today? Well, that ad was very significant for me as a kid. You know, I was trying to explain to my 21-year-old what a big impact it had on me. I told her, you got to remember back then there were only like four things you could watch at any time to choose from. So that means like a quarter of the population saw that at any time. It was constantly on the air. And I took it to heart. I thought people can stop People start pollution, people can stop it. So I picked up litter every day on the way to school. I did exactly what they wanted me to do, which was perfect my own individual action and focus on that. So a couple of things about that ad. First of all, it's not an Indian, it's an Italian dressed up as an Indian. Let's just be clear on that. <laughs> Second of all, it was not created by an environmental group. It was created by a faux environmental group that was um, launched by a bunch of packaging companies, plastic packaging producers and, and users. And their goal was not to stop pollution. Their goal was to get us to stop putting the heat on them and to put the heat on us. And it was enormously successful. And my entire generation took it to heart and thought that by perfecting our individual actions, we can solve these problems. And I, I, I want to be clear, it is really important that we recycle, that we compost, that we, you know, do all those things are the right things to do. But that's not how we create big, bold systemic change. At this point, with the scale of the problems that we have, doing things like carrying your own bag to the grocery store and not littering, those sort of fall in the category of flossing your teeth and washing your hands. Like this is basic adult hygiene. This is not deep political change. But, but it was intentional because they know that when we come together, not as individuals, but working together 
as engaged civil society, that's how we make change. And when I look at the climate movement now, we have every single thing we need. I think it was Gina one, or Tamara, one of you just said this is not rocket science. We know how to power our country. We know how to meet people's needs in an equitable, just, and sustainable way. We have model economic policies. We have innovative green technologies. We have common sense. We have every single thing we need except the power to make it so. And that comes from people not focusing on perfecting their individual actions, but working together. And that's where the movement is now. And that's why we're gonna see change. That's why we've already seen Biden's chip plan move so much and we're gonna move even further. Also in 2005, BP popularized the concept of a personal carbon footprint and launched an online calculator in conjunction with this Beyond Petroleum campaign run by Ogilvy and Mather. So the very notion of a, I just learned this recently, been doing this a long time, the very notion of a personal carbon footprint was popularized by an oil company that was kind of, again, focusing action back on the individual. Tamara, how can people think about more about systems than straws? Sure. Happy, happy to jump in on that. But just first want to flag that, that one, it's an entirely different podcast, the conversation around how uh, coal, oil and gas benefited from asbestos and trash uh, legacy of creating the disinformation machine. We are not up against our individual choices for a real reason, because we have been told that we are our own problem and we are our own solution, which allows us to overlook the 70% of things we could do together. So just wanted to flag that like the question around whether we're talking about uh, 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 personal use straw, you can stick it wherever you'd like it uh, for, for all the good intents is if it's, if it's metal and recycle it, if it isn't. But, but, but one thing I think is really really important is that we are not going to save the planet, the whales, or any people if we are not looking at the largest corporate actor. Seven out of 10 of the biggest things we could do to save this planet involve shutting down fossil fuels, ending their reign on our democracy, taking their filthy money out of our conversations, uh, the way we talk about problems, the way we frame solutions, the kind of data that we use. They have so infiltrated every part of this that there are many words that you'd have to bleep if I used to talk about plastic is so much a part of our lives that we forget that it's another part of this conversation around what's happening with coal, oil, and gas. Every single thing you could touch within five feet of you is somehow connected to this industry. And that did not happen by accident. It happened because of a concentrated campaign to infiltrate your life with things you do not need and make you feel like you can't make change. So getting together with other people to really focus on who the bad actors are, where the largest um, bang for our buck would be if we get together leads you back to the same place ending the the reign of fossil fuels in the climate decade so we're in the same conversation whether we talk about um recycling composting plastic straws personal behavior i get so many questions around whether or not we should change our eating habits sure go ahead and change them i'm sure your health practitioner would be thrilled if you did but the thing you could do for the planet is to really focus on the loosening the grip of coal oil and gas on our future and doing that with other people who agree to the same so yeah i mean i think personal choice is important but in the aggregate the only thing we can do is deal with systems because the system itself is broken and what i would argue is that if the problems that we have all identified just in the beginning of this conversation are about design the answer is redesign like and i, and I think that's a lot scarier um than people might think because it involves making the change that gina referred to but i can assure you redesign is what we know how to do best we didn't end up in this moment by accident roadways, airways, transportation, jobs, infrastructure, human health. We designed all of it and we designed the rest of the ecosystem and consigned it to our fate. So it's time for us to do the work of redesign by examining the premises underneath what we are talking about here. So you, you really pushed my, my, my big ticket item as an advocate, but systems level practice is about doing what you do as if you were everyone else and then asking for us to do more. Gina McCarthy, you've gone locked horns with the powerful fossil fuel interests in Washington. Exxon was recently removed from the uh, the Dow, which is quite a symbolic measure in terms of its prominence as in the American economy. But the fossil fuel industry still has endless, virtually endless amounts of money to defend their profit streams. You know, even if Joe Biden gets in there, there's still coal state Democrats, still lots of concentrated power defending those interests. How does that play out?
you're on you're on a mute there, Gina. Uh, I told you I can never get these buttons right. <laughs> um, these fossil fuel companies are just literally shameless, to to be honest with you. So they'll never go away. I think one of the biggest challenges we have to face, and it was a challenge that was pretty much front and center in the Green New Deal, and ends up being a significant sort of. Uh, push point in the Biden in the Biden plan is that is that you with there these Democrats are worried about the economy in their states. We have to acknowledge that we are worried about the economy in their states. I'm worried about jobs. That's why it's if it's a systemic issue, you worry about the economy and jobs. It's not like we want to shut down all of the, the coal mining and just leave people to their own devices. We're talking about a just transition. So will that make them happy? Maybe not. But they have to get over the fact that the world is changing. It's just how. And if you don't want a world that is going to change and shut everything down, then we have to talk about transitioning the world we have to a new system. And, and Greg, can I just react to two things Tamara said? Because it, it was pretty powerful. The first thing is this plastics issue drives me crazy. If anything drives me crazy, it's sort of this one, because the fossil fuel industry is sitting under the radar screen as if the problem with plastics wasn't theirs. It, the, the reason plastics don't go away is they're fossil fuels in another form. And the industry, as soon as they realize they might be phasing out of some part of the power sector, they started building huge plastics factories where? In Cancer Alley. Be, because these people need jobs. Nobody needs a new plastics factory. Everybody needs a job right? And so it's just the, the shamelessness of this. But the other issue that I want to hit is this, you know, this, we are overtaken now by people who just talk about individual freedoms. It's this whole mask thing, right? As if they're exerting their own personal freedom. You know, the, the United States was built on, in our, certainly our regulatory structure, was built on the fact that every human being has a right to air, Clean air, clean water, clean land, a safe place to live, a house over their heads, good food to be able to eat. That's individual freedom. Individual freedom isn't about masquerading by getting rid of regulations that are solely in place because you stop other people from having those fundamental rights. And so you have to be regulated. See, so you have... So this is my life here. I don't regulate to add burden. I regulate to allow people to have their lives. And because otherwise, how is a single individual or community going to stand up to a coal producer or company in their midst if it wasn't the, the government stepping in and doing its job to protect people? So this whole sort of bastardization of the idea of individual freedom is really behind so much of the challenges we have today. You have no right to kill other people. You have no right to do that. Annie Leonard, you uh, talk about a book called Democracy and Change. The, the, I think the flip side of what Gina is talking about is the narrative since Reagan about how government is stupid and ineffective and that the ultimate consummation of that is Trump kind of destroying the federal government. So tell us about Democracy in Chains. That's a fantastic book, Democracy in Chains by Nancy McLean. I think the subtitle is How the Far Right Took Over the Government in the United States. And it talks about this multi-multi-decade campaign to discredit and dismantle the government, to dismantle and discredit the idea that a robust, accountable, functioning government is good for society. And you saw it when Ronald Reagan came in and said, the government is not the solution to the problem, the government's the problem. You saw it when Grover Norquist said, let's make the government so small you can drown it in the bathtub, which is like a really disturbed, disturbed thing to say. Or you saw it in Steve Bannon saying that his, his mission was a deconstruction of the administrative state. What that means is deconstruction of the regulation that Gina just talked about that provide safe air, safe water. Um, one would hope that they provide environmental justice. They protect people. We want these things. These are the kinds of things that makes America great, more safe, more healthy, more fair, and more secure. 
And so one of the good things about the aftermath of the COVID crisis, I feel like it's opened up that, um, that the dominance of that narrative. It's making people rethink, oh, maybe actually we do need a government. Maybe some problems like a global health pandemic or the complete hegemony that the fossil fuel corporations hold on our government, maybe these, you know, climate, the climate crisis, maybe these are so big that we should actually listen to the science. We should actually welcome the government. So I think there's a real opening for us to push back on that anti-government argument right now. If you're just joining us, our guests at Climate One today are Annie Leonard, Executive Director of Greenpeace. Gina McCarthy is President and CEO of the NRDC Action Fund and former head of the EPA under President Obama. And Tamara Tolls O'Loughlin, North America Director of 350.org. I'm Greg Dalton. Tomorrow, there's often a narrative that you know, our house is on fire. We got to put out this fire, climate change. We can worry later about other things like who has many toys or you know racial justice. Some of this wealth distribution stuff that can wait later. And you say that the you know some of the crescendo moments for you were Katrina and Flint, um, which show that. So tell us about the lessons from Katrina and Flint and the idea that racial justice should somehow come later. Sure, uh, I would say that that's also a function of design. The work of environment and which began from the work of conservation literally involved the murdering and displacement of tons of people. And then we focused on a blade of grass or pardon me, a trigger warning, sage grouse. I know a lot of people fought and died for that. So just wanna flag that like, there are a lot of things that we have put into very slim and narrow conversations around what is the environment. We built a whole cottage industry around it, but we do not talk about people. So it's actually quite revolutionary in this moment that we can talk about people and planet because we wrote every law as though, as though magic hands would make it happen. Uh, we didn't factor in the impacts on how any of this was going to focus on people. We are in a moment where we really have um, a specific view of racial justice as a part of climate justice, because to do anything else is to completely excerpt the future from the conversation that we're in. We can no longer pretend that parks will be great if there aren't any people in them, or that the next generation of people won't be Black, Indigenous, or people of color. Despite what's going on in this country in so many spaces, the census has projected that we will be a multicultural people sooner than we think. And given that that's true, every part of conservation and environment and, um, and restoration practices for land, air, water, and all of that work comes together with the sacrifice zones that we have exiled our neighbors, ourselves into. We have zoned people to death, and none of that is what the future looks like. Because coming together for integrated solutions through a lens where we do not accept people's identity as a reason to exclude them from doing this work, because the future is us doing this work together, that sounds radical until you say it out loud. And then it sounds ridiculous. Because what about being Black, Indigenous, or a person of color would make you anything other than an original steward of what we have going here? We are the people of the global majority. If you cannot see me, I am a Black woman. So let me just let me just put that out there. But the, we're in a moment where we're doing this work authentically means making sure all the impact that folks are in the room, not as a favor, but because it gives us a strategic advantage on how to deal with the issues of our time. The stewardship issues we are facing now are not new. The crises and the urgency of failing to do stewardship work for this long has delivered us to this moment. So whether we're talking about a standing up in an upright with a movement for Black lives, recognizing that Latino votes are about Latino people. Like, like raising our issues around our race consciousness is actually the only defense we have left for, a world, for the world that we're in. You don't have to be a futurist to care about climate justice. You have to be someone who's looking at the reality of what it would look like to try to do this work in the ways that we have done before. And we can't extract any further. All of this is too extractive to keep going. The sustainability of ourselves and our planet require us to take on a lens of, act, of proactivity. We have to be in right relationship with each other as people before we can be in right relationship with the planet. So it feels like a radical concept unless and until you think it through. Gina McCarthy, so many white people have had you know, reckonings lately, sort of understanding things that people of color have said, yeah, we've been living with that and that's, that's new to you. It's not new to us. What have you learned about your own white privilege since George Floyd was murdered? I mean, 
<laughs> Damn it. I'm such a moron. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, myself and all of, um, and, and a, a lot of people in my family and my friends and certainly my work colleagues, you know, we, we all of a sudden had to step back and, and realize that our old, you know, our old wisdom of, yeah, I'm a good person. You know, I, I care about these things just sort of fell all apart. And, and, and I realized when I was doing work in climate that when you, when you really think about all the work that needs to be done, you know, you, you're thinking about all the housing that, that needs to be retrofit, you know, and turned into electricity. You're thinking of the transportation challenges. Then you watch COVID-19 hit and you realize you know, all of these challenges, the vast majority of them are really the result in many communities of just systemic racism. It started in federal law, you know, and it's worked its way and it's still happening. And then you look at, at how you grow jobs and I'm not going to convince, you know, a, a coal miner to take a $90,000 a year job and, and then go put solar panels up for 20,000. You know, you, we have to really look at the disparities here. And if we fail to do that, there is no lasting solution here. You know, haven't people figured this out? <laughs> you know, so, so the great thing in, from my point of view in, in terms of what it means for environmental groups like NRDC, it means that our partners have to be, you know, people who care about housing. You know, we just got invited to be on a, on a, a really great national um, committee that's looking at how to address the housing crisis and how to get the homeless people taken care of. You know why? Because I have a lot of young employees and staff people at NRDC who are working on energy efficiency for all, which are programs that is really looking at doing energy efficiency in, in areas that have been left behind, the poor communities. It's saving them money, it's reducing energy demand, it's taking care of mold in houses that make our kids have asthma attacks. And you're looking at this going, this is how we wanna act as environmentalists. I don't want everyone to come to my table. I wanna recognize that going to theirs is where the action is because they can help define the solutions that are best for them. It's the same with transportation. Everybody's gonna be making big EV announcements. I'd like to know how transit's gonna recover from the, the economic you know, sort of crisis that we're in. I'd, I'd like to know how you get walking and biking so that people actually have healthy choices in a city. So there's other questions that, we, that bring in the variety of and texture of the wonderfulness of, of the, the, the people in, in our country who really want to work together. And, and I, if we actually think that the racial injustice can continue for a moment longer, then we have missed the entire message that, that the three of us are trying to give today. It is part and parcel of why we are where we are. Somebody else designed that world. And we have to, as Tamara says, just redesign the whole thing and recognize that we're just not on a path of sustainability. It's not gonna make my grandchildren the kind of future that they, have, they need to have. And we can't tolerate it. It's a silly uh, uh, argument that just doesn't understand the kind of world we live in and the world we have to live in. Annie Leonard, what are your blind spots on your white privilege and how do you make sure that you, you keep looking for them? My blind spots are infinite on why my white yeah. privilege because I am a product of this system and this system has been designed to benefit white people. And that may, that may sound jarring for some of you listeners, but just think about it. Look at the education system, the healthcare system, the criminal justice system, the environmental movement in an infinite number of ways the systems were designed to benefit white people. And that's what we talk about unearned privilege. I had an advantage coming out of the womb just by being white. And if, if I have an advantage just by being white, by definition, that means others were held back. Others were discriminated against. And so it's not as simple as saying, I'm a racist or I'm not a racist. There's a, not a deeper level of engaging with this which is about recognizing the embedded systems of white supremacy throughout our system, including our movement, 
And then not just recognizing and saying, oh, that's a bad thing, but actively dismantling it. We have to, we have to not just um, be, be not racist, we have to be active anti-racist. And we have to do it because it's the right thing to do. We also have to do it because as Tamar said, it's a strategic advantage to build a movement big and broad and inclusive enough to drive change at the level that we need to be able to take on the fossil fuel industry. We need everybody, but we also need to do it because absent that winning is not really winning. That it's the same fundamental logic that sustains and justifies extraction and destruction of the planet that also justifies extraction and, and harming black, brown and indigenous communities. You know, Heather McGee has an upcoming book. Heather McGee is with Demos. She has a book coming up called The Sum of Us. The subtitle is How Racism Harms Us All. And she found such a fascinating thing. She did a tour of the country interviewing people. She found that the existence of racism makes overall pollution, overall climate change worse because white people, because we, we say other, we other people, we say that those people over there, it's called othering them, because we other communities of color and say it's okay for them to be polluted, the net pollution goes up or the gross pollution, the total pollution goes up because we have allowed some sacrifice zones. If we refused to abide by the system of white supremacy, if we rejected racism, if we rejected the concept of, of sacrifice zones, everybody would have less pollution. So it, it really is essential that um, uh, anti-racism approach be integrated into the core of the work that we are doing, or we will just literally never ever win. And Abram Kendi, X Kendi's book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, is one of the really useful guides for how to do that. I've certainly only recently understood the difference between non-racist, which I thought was good enough, and being anti-racist, which is something entirely different. I thought I'm I'm not a racist, you know, you know my mom had a black boyfriend and when I was in high school, like I'm good, but that's, that's not <laughs> enough. Right. Yeah. That, um, that takes us back to the idea of individual change in your individual mm -hmm. footprint and whether or not you need to take on a systems analysis, because if you're looking at your individual behavior, you're only as good as the last thing you did in that analysis. Anyway, <laughs> I just want to flag that, that like you could take a turn <laughs> every moment. <laughs> you managed to make a racist widget factory in New York, where, in the U.S., where you could be you could be prejudiced, you could be uh, discriminatory, you could be racist, you could pick any shade you like. But the system itself builds us all into into lanes where this is what we're choosing to do, and then hides our prejudices, our disbelief, and our in interest in self preservation enshrined in law. And that's really where we have to look at from the Indian Removal Act to 1830 to Jim Crow to 1985, when we saw the last of the covenant for ra uh, racialized housing covenants in Baltimore, where I am, trust me, we have a history of hiding our biases in the system. So if we don't take the system down, we have no chance as individuals to reduce our footprint in any of these realms. So, and I also think that the cool thing about that is it's not just on you to do it. This is going to be tough work. And so the benefit of a systems analysis is that it requires everybody. Yeah, and an election doesn't solve it either. You know, electing Barack Obama didn't end racism. It just kind of actually, you know, created quite a backlash. I'm going to go to our lightning round for our guests, Gina McCarthy, Annie Leonard, and Tamara Tolls O'Laughlin. Um, I'm going to mention a person, place, or thing and get your reaction off the top of your mind with wild, reckless, unfiltered abandon. Um, uh, First, Gina McCarthy, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say your former boss, Mitt Romney? <laughs> what, what comes to mind is um, that he's been pretty good of late. Uh, I work for him. I like him. He's a normal human being. Uh, and he, I actually got him to sign our climate action plan. But he, he put a little cover letter that said, but I'm not sure about the science. That's it. Uh, Annie Leonard, what's one word or phrase that comes to mind when I say John Muir? He heavy, heavy, mixed, complicated. Things are, things are hard. Uh, tomorrow tolls O'Loughlin, the Republican Party's stance on climate change. Non-existent. Uh, Gina McCarthy, Flint, Michigan. Painful. Annie Leonard, the book Democracy in Chains. Read it now. Uh, tomorrow tolls O'Loughlin, 
R B G. Everything. Mm. Use everything. Uh, Gina McCarthy, what comes to mind when I say China's pledge today to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060? Uh, getting there. Uh, this will be uh, true or false. Um, true or false for tomorrow tolls of Laughlin. Environmental groups have asked you to take jobs without real responsibility to make them look more diverse. False. I'm, a have, I'm like brown bread. There's no chance that I could show up with less density. <laughs> so so you, you didn't accept the jobs, but have you been offered jobs like that? Uh, I'll put them in the circular file and say no. Uh, the, the, offer, the offers will continue to come, but uh, I'm not about that life, so probably no. Uh, true or false, Gina McCarthy, academia is not your cup of tea. Correct. True. <laughs> yes. We. Oui. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Annie Leonard, true or false, there is a climate champion on the ballot. False. We can make one. We, there's somebody we can make into a climate champion. But, you know, I should say actually to be determined, right? We're, we're waiting to see. But it's up to us. The climate champions are on this panel. It's going to say we are the ones that are going to make him deliver on climate. No oh, climate messiah. Uh, Gina McCarthy, uh, true or false, national climate policy passed by one party will not be durable. That is true. Uh, last one for tomorrow, Tulsa Laughlin. You don't eat meat and you don't care if other people eat meat. True. I don't give a damn. <laughs> uh, you know, that gets to gets, gets through our lightning round. Uh, and that point gets uh, uh, Gina McCarthy to a part about judging and shaming. So much of uh, environmentalism is we're all looking at each other. When I see people idling in their car with the air conditioning on, I get mad and want to like, you know, go talk to them. I'm like, oh, no, that's not right. You know, talk about this judging and shaming that just seems to be consume so much energy among people who are trying to be virtuous and do the right thing. Is that worth it? No, no, it isn't. I, I mean, I, I, ju I just don't think that's the way to make people change. You know, the, the way to make people change is to tell them what you is is to sort of bring them along to understand that there's another way to live that's better for them and better for us uh, i mean I, I i i'm all about sort of hope and not chasing school buses down the street um, but i will tell you i get really annoyed when buses idle um, and there have been times when i have rapped on the door and uh and and really gotten upset about it but that's only because i care about people and i'm such a lovely person I just can't help uh, myself sometimes. Also, the kids on the back of the bus got to breathe that stuff. That's a, yeah. there you go. As kids yeah. on the bus everywhere, that's gross. It is. We have a question from uh, one of our listeners listening to the live stream from Sally. She asks you, uh, three brilliant women, how we can change the minds of politicians who've made climate a political issue? I think we should change the politicians. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, I think she just changed the like a light bulb, man. It's sometimes you got to just put in a new, a new, a new, uh, the upgrade. Vote. That's how you can. You vote. can't change the people. Change the people. Uh, <laughs> also, a question from uh, listener Alan. Uh, this is for Gina. How will a six-three right Supreme Court affect climate legislation and regulations? It's it's uh, going to make everything extremely difficult. I mean, I don't think people realize that RBG was really solid on both climate and environment and people's access to the courts to challenge when government doesn't protect them. I mean, she, she was in the majority of the mass versus EPA that really brought carbon pollution into the Clean Air Act and allowed us to regulate it. She was the one who said that people in communities, if someone's polluting them and your government isn't protecting you, you have a right to go after that. I mean, she was the one that stood up for the Clean Water Act uh, when it was being sort of rethought of in the Supreme Court. She's been fundamentally incredibly solid on the environment, which should surprise nobody at this point, I think. So we are in deep trouble on all those things. If you care about climate, um, 
you better start voting for some really good senators uh, and, uh, and uh, a president that's going to make the kind of change we need. That's the only way that's going to protect us. I think we need to really flip the Senate. Another question from Peter asks about whether a carbon tax would be efficient in funding federal uh, uh, transportation, reducing the impact of the carbon industry. Gina McCarthy, we used to hear a lot about carbon pricing. Some people, that is the holy grail, the main way, do that and everything else falls in place. We don't hear about it as much now. How central is climate is uh, carbon pricing? I, th I am praying that, that people realize that that was yesterday's uh, idea and today it's all about doing something that we can make sure that everybody benefits from. Uh, I, I've never agreed with a carbon price. I don't think life is that easy that I can find one solution. It guarantees nothing about protecting human beings where they live and it doesn't actually do the trick to get rid of the other pollutants that always come along with fossil fuels. So uh, it is not my thing. I think if you look at the cast of characters that are pushing for it, you may get a good sense that maybe they're not the ones that really are the ones you wanna to listen to. So I'm not into those things. I wanna do things on the ground to improve people's lives today as, as part of a system of getting at climate change. And it doesn't mean I want little actions. It means I want big ones that actually matter, but not what I consider to be potentially false promises. Any Other than that, I, I just like to add that until the price is high enough to close a business down, it isn't worth raising as an option. A lot of carbon prices yeah, have, have marginal uh, impact. That's um, right. I want to talk about how we talk about climate change because there's some real research, uh, Annie Leonard, that a lot of people, even people who say climate is a concern, they don't talk about it very often. So, and when people do talk about climate, how should they talk about it? Because there's the the doom and gloom. There's the you know the facts that can confuse people. There's the the righteousness. There's lots of ways to. <laughs> shut people down pretty quickly when you bring up the topic climate change. What's a way to open them up? Well, I think how you talk about climate depends on who you're talking to, right? Like you don't say the same thing to every friend that you have. You tailor your conversation to the person and that's what you have to do with climate change. For some, you talk about your grandchildren. For some, you talk about how awesome it'd be if you could have a, a clean way to commute to work on some mass transit. Um, if you're people that are concerned about democracy, you talk about how we have to get fossil fuels out of our government. There's lots of different entree points, but I think that the point of talking about climate change is really fascinating um, and important. Uh, Greg and I were talking about this the other day. The Yale Climate Communication Project has done some research on how people in the United States interact with climate. And what they've found now is that a significant majority of people, it keeps growing, but it's around 75% of the public in the United States understands climate, is worried about climate, wants stronger government action, like 75% of the people agreeing and wanting stronger government action is enough to make it happen. But then when they poll them about, are they active about it yet? Are they talking about it? They're not yet. And there's actually only one place in the country where people say that naturally in their conversations, climate change come up, which is probably because of you, Greg, but it is San Francisco is the only place where people are normally talking about climate change now. And we can't combat something that we don't talk about. So it's really important for folks to get familiar with talking about it in whatever way is comfortable for you. Try different things. There's lots of resources online. We have got to turn the volume up on the conversation about climate change and make it exciting, not blame and shamey as you guys were just talking about, but exciting, inviting. Really, it is a potential way to have a much better, dealing with climate change is a potential way to have a much better, safer, healthier future. And the more we can focus on that, the more inviting it'll be. So everybody Tomorrow. should commit to 10 conversations in the next week about climate change, see how it goes, and then 10 more the next week and end them with asking if folks to register to vote. Tomorrow, how do you talk about it? What, what's you find an effective way to reach uh, people? Incessantly. I mean, I'm a Brooklynite. <laughs> so there are a couple of things I do pretty regularly. Tell people I'm from Brooklyn. They, if they don't hear in my accent or my hands gesticulating wildly and climate change mostly because it is the umbrella to every other conversation. You want to talk about education, 
guess what's going to impact whether or not people can get it, where people would go for it and the conditions they would be in it. I feel like uh, that character in the movie about uh, the big fat Greek wedding, give me a topic, any topic, and we'll probably end up talking about climate change by the end of the conversation. In my community, that's about stewardship. It's about community. It's about making space for people to operate as they have done with resources. And that means thinking about the future, which is endangered if we don't get our hands around what we're doing to drive climate change and build build out the worst trajectory we've ever faced as a species. So I do think talking about climate is like talking about the weather, if you will. <laughs> Meaning that we should do it, do it often. Gina, you say that, you know, talking about this planetary and these huge ginormous numbers, I've been doing this a long time. I don't know what a megawatt or a gigawatt <laughs> is. You know, how, how, how should people talk about climate in a way that's, that's real? I think in ways that's relevant to the person they're talking to, really. I, I like to just talk about it as, you know, uh, as, as choices, you know, do we want a clean energy future and what's that's going to do for me? You know, how is that going to help me today to do that? And how is it going to be the, the way in which if you invest in it, you're going to, you know, going to drive jobs of the future. You're going to create innovation that's going to provide leadership to the U.S., and that leadership is gonna to spread uh, to the rest of the world. That it's our obligation to think about continuing to move forward. And for the most part, I, I really focus a lot on the health impacts because in my world have it has have in government for as long as I have, I know that the thing that we all have in common is we want our families to be healthy. And really if fundamentally, this is the best health choice and it brings with it you know, all of the benefits that come with a clean energy economy, as well as taking care of that pesky little climate problem, then, I, then I, I, it's really hard, I think, to deflect that. And it's really enticing to want to think about life differently. Um, I think right now, Greg, I don't know about you, but we are just so beaten down with problems mm. that I think it's, it's really our job to tell people that there's a future there for us. And that that future has to be, you know, the one that we invest in, you know, a future that's going to bring everybody involved. And when we start doing that, people will come. Uh, people will come. Hey, Gina, we'll build it. They will come. Gina, another, can I ask? Another movie. Gina, I think your microphone is tucked under your collar there. I was asking me to, um, yeah, you, there we go. Perfect. Oops. Yes. Jeez, Thank I'm you. all I'm technically deficient in so many ways. <laughs> You're a pain in so many ways. <laughs> yeah, that that is true. Was that my husband, uh, Greg, or, or was that you speaking? <laughs> if you're just joining us, we're talking about climate change with Annie Leonard, Executive Director of Greenpeace, Gina McCarthy, President and CEO of the NRDC Action Fund, and tomorrow tolls O'Loughlin, North America Director of 350.org. We have a question from Jeff that will make you all uncomfortable, makes me uncomfortable. What if we get Trump again? Mm. Does I that make a little pit in the in your stomach, like oh, like, like a little like ooh? Makes me, yeah, scared. I, I as as I mentioned, I'm from Brooklyn. He's from Queens. We already had problems before we got here. So just wanted to flag that that like mo the 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 gentleman who lives in housing afforded by all of us public housing in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue uh, has been really awful. He's destroyed everything we care about. He has attacked us full on. He, he has beaten us emotionally and really made life harder for everyone. So I do think four more years of that, uh, the entire planet is in revolt from that idea. Look around from the fires that are turning into tornadoes to the storms that are pushing people out of their homes, turning one in four people into climate refugees. Uh, another four years is impossible to imagine as something that could be in alignment with a future where we survive. So, so I, I hate to be like the bearer of bad news, but we can't take another four years. And, and what we have to do in the next six weeks, the next 40 days to make that happen is even more on the surface. So beyond the pit in my stomach, I feel an unction towards moving in the direction of avoiding that feeling. In 2016, I, I felt that. I felt the thing in my stomach. And I don't ever want to go back to that. I stood outside of the train station near my house in uh, D.C. at the time and watched people hug other people in the street as they cried. 
we have to do everything we can to avoid that moment because the climate is not political. This work is not partisan. And no matter who's in the White House, we need to win on climate. And no matter who's in the White House, we are going to keep pushing that regardless of who is in there, we are going to have such a strong, inclusive, diverse movement. And we are going to man demand that on day one, they act on climate change. It is uh, such a crisis that means stopping new fossil fuel investment. That means supporting these workers. That means investing in a just recovery because our economy is now stalled. And there are so many things that we can have happen and we have enough people. If we can move from being distraught and alone to together and active to make it happen no matter who's in that White House. Question from listener Carol says, uh, what is your best elevator speech to a non-voter who says, candidates are all the same, they all lie, they're politicians who failed us? Uh, my, well, my gut is politicians only do what you give them room to do and what you give them cover for. So our politics are only as bad as our engagement. So at the end of the day, if you don't like what's happening, you can push the button and make them move away. And if you want them to do more, you can get out in the street and create an agenda for yourself. We are no longer in a time where we need a proxy. We set up proxies to make the work happen. So I do think look in the mirror and figure out how far you're willing to go to get the world you want to live in and who else you need to bring along with you because there is no such thing as a lone wolf saving us from climate. Also, while our electoral system has disappointed us many times, there is no way that Trump and Biden are comparable on climate and a huge number of other things. So just look at the um, policies. And while neither is where I wish they were, neither one is saying that they're willing to actually stand up for fossil fuels and say no new fossil fuel uh, permits, which has gotta be, a, gotta be a crucial step. One of them is movable and the other is not. And I would far rather push a moderate than fight a fascist. And they are very, very different. Gina McCarthy, um, how much damage has been done to EPA and can it be yeah. restored in one presidential term? Well, I think, you know, with some of the rollbacks, you know, I think certainly a lot of them are being challenged in court and, and they're losing because they didn't follow the science of the law. But that I, I don't think that really properly characterizes the damage that they've done. You know, I've been a career public servant all my life uh, prior to going to NRDC. And, and I loved every single minute of it. And I worked with some of the most creative and smart and strategic thinkers that I've ever worked with. And, and they were there. They knew what their job was. And it was it was there to protect people. And maybe they couldn't go as far as people want, and maybe sometimes it didn't go well. But this president is is really has undermined the scientific credibility of these agencies. I mean, scientists have left because they can't stand the kind of stifling that that is that is being done uh, to them, and they they want to do the right thing. And and I think if you look at at uh, the past year or two. The rollbacks are, are really being done challenging fundamental ways of reading the law and looking at science and the challenging procedures that have been in place since Ronald Reagan. And, and so it's, it's a dangerous time because many of those fundamental relooks at what the Clean Air Act says in the most creative ways to stifle protections are going to end up at the Supreme Court. They're going to end up there. We're not going to get them out without that kind of fight. And you know that every industry is lining up to support all those appeals all the way up and hopes that a change at the Supreme Court is going to make the most foolish interpretation of a law, the law of the land. And so we have to, you know, you know anybody that, that is just sitting around saying, I, you know, I'm not going to vote. That's probably the worst you know, position that anyone can take. It's indescribably bad and, and negligent. And, and if you don't vote, you get exactly what you deserve. But the problem with that is I get exactly what you gave to me and I won't tolerate it. So if some, you know, I give lots of speeches at colleges and, I, and in the end I say, okay, nice standing ovation. How many of you are registered to vote? <laughs> How many of you voted? And I tell them, if you're not registered to vote and you don't vote as soon as you possibly can, do not stand up or even come in this door again. You know, we got to get serious and we've got to have hope that 
there's someone we want to vote for. And, and I know who I'm voting for. Um, and I'm, I'm going to vote uh, it, just like Mayor Curley in Boston said, vote early and vote often, but don't do the often part. <laughs> yeah, we've had some guidance on that. Yeah. Uh, as, as, we, um, as, we, as we wrap up, I want to ask you, you know, we talked about comfort and getting comfortable with being uncomfort and people kind of thinking mm -hmm. they're doing, addressing climate from the positions of comfort. What would cause you to, I don't know, get arrested, engage in civil disobedience, do something for climate that you have never done before? Really get out there. I mean, I've done lots of changes. I can't say I've sacrificed uh, I've spent money, made modifications. What's that next step tomorrow? What, what's something would cause you, you have a young child, you know, what would cause you to really take that next step? As an African-American in this country, I think I was born in a sacrifice zone. I live in a sacrifice zone, having moved every three years for 20 years doing this work. Every place I've ever lived, I've lived in a sacrifice zone in this body in this racist widget we, machine we call America. So the sacrifices I'm willing to make are to bring in other people who need to do this work. So our work at 350 and 350 Action is so much about educating political alignment, bringing people into a conversation about what and how it is they can weaponize their privilege. That's the sacrifice that I'm willing to make because the optics on that got us here cannot get us to the future. So I'm willing to get into conversation with people who need to put their bodies on the line because it's their turn. Annie Leonard? I want to reframe your question, of course, because first of all, comfort is no longer one of the options on the map. There's like, that path is closed. So the question is really, which discomfort are you going to pick? And um, we are going to change by design or by disaster. Either way, if we, if we are proactive, intentional, if we center justice in our work, if we have the courage to take on the fossil fuel industry, we can change by design. If not, change is still coming, but it's going to be a lot less just, a lot more violent, a lot more painful. So let go of any notion to think that comfort is one of the options. And I'm also gonna challenge your sense of sacrifice, the use of the word sacrifice, because what I'm gonna do, I just turned 56, my college kid is done with college. I'm, I am liberated from a lot of the things that slowed me down when I was a young woman. For me, it is full steam ahead now. I am devoting the rest of my functioning years to fighting climate and sacrifice is not the word I would associate that. I would associate with courage and joy and having a meaningful life. And if anybody on this panel or listening would like to engage in civil disobedience to get arrested, please contact Greenpeace because we have awesome training and lawyers and we'd love to show you how to do that. But sacrifice is not the word. I am gonna fight with everything that I have because honestly, what is at stake is everything that we love. And I invite you all to join us. Gina, last word. The only thing I would say is that, it, that it, if Trump wins again, then, uh, then I don't think there's any choice but to get out of our homes and to make uh, our, our, our views heard. Now, I am not talking about violence, but I am talking about the civil disobedience as a person, the civil disobedience that, that needs to happen when you realize that democracy has been taken from you in a way that is, is illegal and we have to fight it. I cannot envision Trump being the choice of the United States of America for a second time. And if he is, it's because he took it, not because he was given it. And so I, I am, again, not talking about violence and I'm not talking about what I do as NRDC president because they don't like civil disobedience, but civil disobedience was the hallmark of huge change in so many ways. So if anyone says, ooh, civil disobedience, well, think Rosa Parks. Is she a heroine <laughs> or, or not? Uh, think RBG, because I'll bet if she was still alive, she'll be trooping on the streets too. Uh, but anyways, that's it. And uh, Erica Chenoweth at Harvard has done lots of research of so, uh, social movements, what's been successful, peaceful so, civil disobedience by just three and a half percent of the population has shown to be kind of the yeah. tipping point for success. Strict civil disobedience as well as um, doing actions, not because they of their impact, because they're the right thing to do. You know, yeah. you take those individual actions for their own sake, not because of their impact. Um, 
Well, I'd like to give a shout out to the Climate One team, Adam Anderson, Arnav Gupta, Kelly Pennington, Sarah Catherine Coxon, and Tyler Reed for making this happen today. They are awesome. On Climate One today, we've been discussing the window of opportunity for bold climate action in 2021 if Joe Biden becomes president. We also discussed the narratives that drive the climate conversation and framing the climate as a concern for individual change or systems change. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guests today were Annie Leonard, Executive Director of Greenpeace, Gina McCarthy, President President and CEO of the NRDC Action Fund, and tomorrow tolls Laughlin, North America Director of 350.org. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your podcasts. Please help us get more people talking about the climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help advance the conversation. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody.